to the Prince George's County Historical Society's first history chat. I'm Donna Schneider. I'm the president of the Historical Society, and we will be hosting these history chats on a monthly basis on the fourth Monday of the month at seven o'clock. So please join us for our future ones. Um, we're going to have a variety of guest chatters and hosts from the Historical Society. Um, we um, are still trying to finalize our one for next month, but um, we already have, have one. We, we have a series of ideas for the next one. So um, you'll be getting more information as those are finalized. Please note that we will be recording this. So please mute yourself. Um, and turn off your video if you don't want to be captured on camera. Um, if you have any questions, please enter them in the chat box that should be on the bottom of your screen. And we will answer as many questions as possible after the chat concludes. We expect this chat to last approximately an hour with the questions. Tonight's chat is on monuments and memories, and it will be with Maya Davis and John Peter Thompson will be our, uh, our host tonight. Maya Davis is the Legislative Liaison and Research Archivist at the Maryland State Archives, where she consults on statewide projects that document, interpret, and preserve African-American history and culture. Maya currently serves as a commissioner of the Maryland Lynching, Truth, and Reconciliation Commission and the Maryland Commission on African-American History and Culture. Previously, she served as the interim director of the Banneker Douglas Museum and the Maryland Commission on African American History and Culture, S was staff at the City Museum of Washington, DC and vice chair of the Annapolis, Annapolis 1864 <clears throat> Commission to commemorate the emancipation of slavery in Maryland. Thank you, Maya, for joining us for our inaugural chat this evening. Um, and John Peter, please begin. Well, thank you very much, uh, everybody, for joining us. And Maya, thank you so much for uh, agreeing to be with me and with uh, society and the members out here as we explore what Maryland Archives is doing and specifically what you're doing. And of course, I'm very interested in the um, history that was passed over when I was in high school and what Maryland Archives and you are doing to bring the rest of history into focus. And I am so delighted to have you here. Thank you so much for having me, John Peter. My first uh, question is a, is a generic one for our audience. I suppose some already know this, but could you briefly describe what is this thing, the Maryland Archives and in general, and then specifically, what is Maryland Archives doing to bring a light and bringing the history of African American and Black culture, heritage, and history to the general public, mm -hmm. uh, historians, lay or otherwise? Well, thank you. Um, thanks for starting off with a relatively easy question, I think. Um, the Maryland State Archives is essentially the central repository for state records of a permanent value, meaning that um, we receive by law transfers from our county uh, courthouses, registers of wills, or records that are per considered permanent. Um, that includes items like uh, probate records, court records, and um, vital records, which a lot of genealogists tend to use. And we also have a special collections department as well. So that is for um, items that people want to donate, such as private manuscripts, church records, newspapers. We have a whole bevy of items, and we do actually have three-dimensional objects that would be considered material culture at a museum, which a lot of people don't know. Um, we have paintings and sculptures, but typically we do not receive a large amount of um, donations by way of museum material, but we do have a rather large state uh, collection that we oversee through our Artistic Properties Commission. We oversee the uh, State House Complex, which includes both State House and Government House, um, which a lot of people don't know. And so we are kind of responsible for the interpretation of both of those buildings. And right now we are in a place where we're trying to bring balance to the narrative of those buildings. Um, for many years, um, different ethnic groups have been left out of the history of that building. Um, and we've been working to get uh, people like Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass installed through the statuary there, as well as some of the portraiture there. Um, the portrait of Senator Clarence Blount is actually 
actually a reproduction. It's not an original. Uh, we'd like to see some original portraiture actually go into the state house, um, in addition to the plaques of Matthew Henson and others in the building. But, um, you know, we have these huge uh, portraits of the Lords Baltimore and you know, we just want to make sure that we're telling a fuller picture of Maryland's history in our state ground buildings. Um, in regards to what we are doing at the Maryland State Archives, the Maryland State Archives does have a legacy of slavery in Maryland uh, department, which I'm a member of that department. And we actually are responsible for documenting um, really much, pretty much the legacy of slavery to freedom in Maryland. Um, the to freedom portion is gonna be like our next phase of the work that we do with the Maryland State Archives because we largely have concentrated on 17th to 19th century enslavement in Maryland. Um, and we'd like to see that move forward from reconstruction into the 20th century. Maya, is um, I know we're in this new normal where everything is virtual, mm -hmm. but uh, when we get out of new normal and go back to old normal or some variation of that, um, will the general public, can the general public actually go in and do work and research in the Maryland archives? Thanks for asking that, John Peter. I don't know that we'll be returning to an old, well, definitely a new normal. Um, we, during the pandemic, we shut down in early uh, March. I think March 13th was my last day in the office at the Maryland State Archives. And then somewhere in the summer, we attempted to reopen our archives building by appointment only. That lasted until October when we were asked to shut down again to the public um, to prevent the spread of COVID. And we have seen quite an uptick in online orders and we have created an online presence where people can place their orders online. Um, I may get in trouble <laughs> for saying this, but for people that I knew, like if I could get digital access behind the scenes and send people things, I would do that, which I think the state archivist was definitely fine with us doing that. Um, for those who are in the public, they don't know this. A lot of our records on our guide to government records, which is our catalog, it actually will say available on archives computers only. And that means you have to physically be in the archives building and you know view the records from those computers, but you can't view it from home. If I could access it from home, I would kind of share it out with different individuals um, because we realized the limitations that our doors, our physical doors being closed put on our patrons and our patrons have been so dedicated and supportive of our agency for so many years. We wanna make sure that we're doing our due diligence to support them as well. Um, but there is a large amount of material that is not digitized. And so that just kind of creates this barrier that we wish could go away, but we know that we're in a different time. Um, moving forward, we don't have an exact date of when we will reopen, but once we reopen, it will, we will be considering that um, timed ticketed system so that we can make sure that we're preserving, um, you know, the safety and health, like promoting the safety and health of not just our staff um, and volunteers, but then also the people in our public what that will look like in the future. We just don't know um, what our capacity is gonna be yet until we receive that directive from our governor and legislature. Well, what I'd like to do now um, is turn to the, the the topic at hand and I, I'm visualizing, visualizing, I'm virtualizing uh, a timeline uh, that involves the Network to Freedom, I, I'd like to explore what that is and, and why it's important. And I see that as sort of a, up to the Civil War period. So we'll do that one first. And then maybe a discussion of your work and the work being done around uh, commemorating Harriet Tub Tubman's uh, contributions to American history, as well as Frederick Douglass. And then, um, Something that I'm very interested in is your work on the uh, Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, as it has to do with lynching the Black Code, um, Jim Crow in that era. And I understand we have, what, three days to cover these topics? Is that correct, moderator? <laughs> so, so let's start with the Network to Freedom. What is it? 
Uh, why should we care? How do we use it? Take it away. Okay. <laughs> so the Network to Freedom is really a program of the National Park Service. And the Maryland State Archives actually is a member of the Network to Freedom. We applied um, through an application process that they have. And their application process really is a place where individuals could put forth a um, application for a site where a flight may have taken place or a site where someone who escaped um, was associated with, whether that be a church, a cemetery, um, a home of an abolitionist, a safe house, anything of that nature. But then there's also um, programs. There are programs, and this is a national program, so there's programs from here all the way down to the United States Virgin Islands, all the way up to Detroit, Michigan, and Canada. Um, and the network is actually growing. Uh, they've discovered sites in Hawaii, as well as in uh, Mexico on the border, uh, where individuals have escaped and settled in those areas. So they're working with different groups and historians to um, document the flight to freedom. And I will say, I think that it's extremely important for this um, work to be done because we know a lot about enslavement and we know a lot about Underground Railroad, but there's so much information that we don't know. We're still trying to figure it out and that's why it matters now. Because as we all know, it was supposed to have been a covert operation that people did not know about. And while there are many records out there that we are familiar with, there are many, many more that are, you know, untapped. And I, I just think it's a really interesting topic. Um, I think a lot of genealogists, especially African-American genealogists, as there's this big void of information a lot of times and connecting their family legacy and lineage, I think it'll be important for um, that community. And, you know, I just, I think that it's one of the most important topics of the 19th century. Would it be fair to say um, that the, as the network acquires information about routes and places and methods of escape, that we are in some ways mapping the Underground Railroad? We are, and um, the state of Maryland does a really great job um, of keeping track of the directions that they're starting to uncover related to those maps. And they've actually put out maps um, related to the uh, Network of Freedom. And the one thing I forgot to say is I think that a lot of um, cultural institutions would be very interested in knowing is that once you are a member of the Network of Freedom, when they accept your application, you then become eligible for grant funding for your site for things like interpretation. And as you know, grant funding is drying up worldwide and it's just really hard and there's a lot of competition there. And I think the more grant funding opportunities we know about, a lot of this work can be done. Um, for example, the Maryland State Archives, given our staff size, we don't have enough staff to process our records. Almost 80% of our collections are unprocessed. Wow, 80%. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's astounding and it shouldn't surprise me. I know other collections and other fields where 80% seems to be the number that's not digitized and not processed. So that's, that seems to be a statistic. I wanna go back to the Underground Railroad. I, I have a, a, a fascination, I hope that's the right word, of the Underground Railroad and the escape from Prince George's County in Southern Maryland. And I'm wondering how much work do you know of that's been done on here in Prince George's County, Charles County, St. Mary's, obviously they'd have to come up unless they were on a boat. They'd have to come through Prince George's County to yeah. head north. Yeah, Prince George's County is a really unique county. Um, one, in that it holds the largest enslaved population in the state. Um, I feel like I say that at every presentation and people are probably tired of hearing me say it, but I don't think people think of it in that way. I've, I've met people that actually thought the largest contingent was on the Eastern shore and that just wasn't the case. Um, and there wasn't a large free black population in Prince George's County. So it made it even more difficult but the one thing that Prince George's County, as well as um, more Southern counties like Coward and Charles had in their favor is that it bordered 
Washington, D.C., where there was a large free Black population. So when you look at communities on the Eastern Shore or in counties such as Frederick, you see those people kind of blending into areas like Baltimore or even running further into, you know, places like Pittsburgh and Philadelphia and New York and Canada. But in Prince George's County, we kind of had a luxury of having the free Black community and being able to kind of hide in plain view and hire yourself out. And so that's a story that I find very interesting. I know um, Jenny Massore, who used to be the regional director for our area for the Network to Freedom, um, she actually has done a book on um, Underground Railroad in Washington, D.C. area, and she is actively working on one on Maryland. Um, ah. Yeah, it, it's a lot out there and Prince George's County is just so unique when I think about um, organizations like the Maryland National Capital Park and Planning, which has all these different historic sites um, like Riversdale, Darnell's Chance, they're all members of the Network to Freedom because they have this flight to freedom story. Um, the way that we've kind of supported that effort at the Maryland State Archives is through our grant projects. We have targeted Prince George's County as an area where we would take uh, newspapers and extract all of the runaway ads for a certain time period, typically 1830 to 1864, to extract from Prince George's County newspapers or um, the Daily National Intelligence, and they were part of our database, which I can actually put our um, link to our database in the chat at the end of this chat. Well, that, that's um, news to me, and I didn't know about <laughs> the upcoming book, so I need to stay tuned and, and uh, I'm sure our library will, the Society Library will be reaching out when it's ready. Um, the Underground Railroad and the Escape to Freedom naturally, to me, uh, begs the question or opens the door is a better thing to Harriet Tubman and the work doing um, to memorialize what she did, what she contributed, um, and, you know, this amazing woman what's happening with her and her place and her routes in history and in Maryland. Okay, um, I, I wanna be honest and forthright with this group. I came to the Maryland State Archives 16 years ago with a bias that I, I was just in love with Frederick Douglass from the time I was in third grade. And he was one of my greatest heroes and I never had really put as much energy into Harriet Tubman until I arrived at the Maryland State Archives. Um, and it was there that I not only fell in love with her, but I gained a respect for her and what she brought to the table. Um, I first became more engaged with her um, through Harriet Tubman Day, which became a, a state recognition day. Um, Lou Fields, who is an African-American tour guide in Baltimore, Maryland, he is really probably most responsible more than any other person for bringing about uh, recognition to Harriet Tubman on a state level um, from the work that he had done. I mean, he beat down the doors of the Office of Tourism. He beat down the doors of our state legislators and demanded that we recognize Harriet Tubman. And every year he did a program where he recognized the contributions of scholars towards the work of African-American history in the state of Maryland on Harriet Tubman Legacy Day, which is March 10th. And oh, there, you know, he would always ask us to attend and participate in his program. Can you speak here? Can you tell the public this? And so I kind of got engaged in that way. Um, I also was able to lean in and uh, get to know Kate Larson, who has become a great friend of mine. And she is a biographer of Harriet Tubman and probably has the most um, in-depth account of Harriet Tubman's life in her book, Bound for the Promised Land. And during my time at the Maryland State Archives, um, you know, I have a background in history and museum studies. So on my museum piece, you know, I do a lot of exhibition work at the State Archives for different projects. And one of the ones I was involved in was the uh, creation of the Harriet Tubman State Park and Visitor Center over in Dorchester County, Maryland, that's open today. And that really gave me a chance because then you read all this information about Harriet Tubman and much like Frederick Douglass is so much, is so much that she did and, um, you know, a lot to take in, but working on that project gave me an opportunity to look at the actual records as opposed to reading these secondary sources, but to actually look at actual records related to her life 
including newspaper accounts, a ledger that we have in the Maryland State Archives that we believe is the record of her birth from her owner's ledger. Um, you know, the sales, we actually in our collection don't have the newspaper ad for her runaway, but from making those connections with our community partners, um, someone on the Eastern Shore at a different site there actually had the runaway ad and shared that with us. And so we can kind of further understand who she was in Maryland and then beyond the walls of our state. And you did ask, did you ask me what the next phase is with Harriet Tubman? I didn't, but um, you should tell us. Okay, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> I'm jumping the gun here. No, 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 that's, that, please. There isn't, you know, since we, we have new statues in the state house and we have interpretation there, but the plan is for further interpretation because Harriet Tubman is often in difference to Frederick Douglass and other uh, male figures of her time and her peers, such as Henry Highland Garnett, Douglass, Samuel Ringgold Ward, is often writ written out of history, um, kind of as this enslaved woman who magically made it out of freedom. But following that, I mean, she served as a Civil War spy, and I can share this now, um, her great-grandniece, Tina Wyatt, she actually was an honorary member um, of uh, a military organization where they recognized her um, partially because she didn't really enlist in the military um, like other USCT members. She now has full recognition within um, the USCT as being a military scout and spy on behalf of the uh, United States. So we're very proud of that. And there's a lot of work that she's done as a suffragist and that work is being done as well. And we're writing that into her history as a part of the interpretation. Uh, we know that she spoke regularly on the uh, suffragette circuit and was dedicated to that effort uh, after you know emancipation nationally. And I just think that is just something to really kind of praise her for. And prior to the suffragette movement, she's like on the circuit to advocate for the emancipation of all enslaved people. I, um, of course, this has nothing to do with Maryland history, but I knew the Maryland Harriet Tubman story at a very, what shall we call it, high level without the detail. And my interest in military operations in the Civil War I was exploring things down in Charleston and who do I find leading the Union Army up rivers around Charleston? Yes. Harriet Tubman. And then out of curiosity, I sort of follow the military side after the war. And I think she spends 20 years or so trying, she, she has these general officers and, and and commissioned officers of the Union Army writing Congress that this woman deserves a full pension. I think it's 20 yes. years before Congress gets around and says, oh, well, okay. <laughs> In spite of the high level military officers who are saying, you know, what gives here? So sorry, I digress. Um, right. a, a remarkable woman. Remarkable. You mentioned Frederick Douglass, and I, of course, have. Um, just finished the, the new biography of him. And I personally think every American needs to read this. Um, and, and I am astounded how much I thought I knew and turns out I didn't know about Frederick Douglass, an amazing man. So um, what's Marilyn doing with Frederick Douglass? Um, I'm so happy that you asked that. Um, that book by David Blight, is really an amazing book. And I dare to even say with him going to the edges of the earth that next year, the year after that, and a lifetime beyond the life of myself and the Maryland State Archives, there will still be more to find about Frederick Douglass. It just seems that he touched the edges of the earth and we just had no idea how vast that was from him being the most photographed person of the 19th century uh, the records that have popped up. I, I did a conference that I participated in in Scotland two years ago to commemorate the 200th year of his birth. Um, there's a house that he lived in there. They unveiled signage um, at that home where he stayed when he was in Scotland. But with us, what we're doing, um, we actually installed the two statues of Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman. The state actually has um, 
works towards a park um, for Frederick Douglass, similar to what they have for Harriet Tubman down in uh, Dorchester County. Uh, the H Frederick Douglass thing is not, I, right now being in the moment, it feels like it's not moving as fast as it could, but knowing that the Harriet Tubman project took us more than 10 years to actually complete. It took us like the bulk of my time here at the archives to actually get it done. Um, it's going to take time. And so, you know, I, I'm really excited about where we go with Frederick Douglass um, outside of just having their statuary in the state house, which I think was long overdue. Um, that call had been in place long before I even arrived at the state house. But, you know, we have that recognition. And I just think that as we help communities understand who these individuals were, we'll start to see more and more come out of this. Well, I can't resist noting that um, in the last year or so, I, I have the opportunity to have extended calls with uh, diverse political opinions and people across the spectrum. And when it comes to discussion of American history and some of the uh, issues facing us today between received history and additional history, I find myself remembering what I read of Frederick Douglass and pointing out to people, you're, you're reinventing the wheel, go read Frederick Douglass, replace a few names and he's talking to you today. It is so amazing to me that you don't have to change, you just change the name of the president or the senator and it's the same situation. It, He's addressing the issues exactly today. You just change the names. You don't have to change anything else. Well, from Frederick Douglass, I, um, and because of my reading of that and my understanding of the history after the Civil War in this country and in this state, uh, 1876 comes and here come the Black Codes. Um, when I was in school, there was a paragraph or two that referred to something called Jim Crow and then we quick, quickly glossed over whatever that was. Um, and it, it's only in the last 30 or 40 years that as I got into local history and state history that I came face to face with segregation, the Black Code and Jim Crow. And of course the extrajudicial of enforcement of segregation which is commonly known as lynching. So I understand that you're a commissioner on a commission. Do you want to tell us a little bit about this commission? Yes, I would be happy to talk about the commission at length because it's what I'm doing most recent at the Maryland State Archives. Um, in 2019, Delegate Joseline Pena Milnick put forth um, a bill introduced the bill to the General Assembly um, to create a Maryland Lynching Truth and Reconciliation Commission, which would actually um, be charged with researching uh, the 40 plus incidents of racial terror lynchings that occurred in the state of Maryland um, from 1854 to 1933. Um, we are often asked why those dates. Um, those dates were the dates that the Maryland State Archives had for a project that it did some years ago, even prior to my time there, uh, called Judge Lynch's Court. And within that project, um, they recorded a lynching as early as 1854. And the last one that they recorded in the state that we all know of is um, the uh, Matthew Williams and George Armwood lynchings that occurred in 1931 and 33. And, you know, in hindsight, as I think about that legislation, um, it it was really great because we are the first state commission and I think Delegate Pena Milnick did a beautiful job um, getting bipartisanship, overwhelming support um, from individuals that I didn't even think would support this bill, honestly, and they did support the bill and um, it went to vote unanimously. And so that was that is how we were created essentially. The one fault that we probably have is the timeline because as we're hoping and expecting to uncover new incidents of lynchings that we didn't know about, if anything falls outside of that 1854 to 1933, it's outside of our mandate. But knowing that 
the height of um, the lynchings that occurred, not just in Maryland, but nationally, especially in the Deep South, um, occurred in those years of the Reconstruction, what is known as the Reconstruction period. Um, and so I can tell you just today, our research committee, we met and we discussed someone that we recently discovered in Queen Anne's County that we did not have li listed before. And so we're expecting to find a lot of new people. Maryland, in terms of numbers, um, 40 on a national scale is relatively low in comparison to places like Alabama and Mississippi. But one lynching is one lynching too much, as you know. And this is an opportunity for us to kind of educate the public that a lynching is not just uh, hanging by a mob on a tree or from a post, a light post or something like that. A lynching is extrajudicial mob violence. So that could be play out in the form of a dragging and any kind of murder by someone that is more than two people. And this is happening. Um, we recently have been looking at records such as um, coroner's inquests to actually uh, see how the murders of African-American people are being documented in the coroner's inquest, um, which is there's a lot of accidental drownings. Um, there's incidents that we've seen where three men were killed when their cars suddenly stopped on train tracks, stalled on train tracks. And so just kind of getting people um, an understanding of lynching. And then also just knowing that this has been such a taboo topic. It, prior to now, you know, you would kind of see here and there like a small exhibit that touched on lynching or a book that touched on it. But I think this may open up the floodgates. Uh, we've been invited to a series of different conferences and different groups to kind of talk with them about how they will form a truth and reconciliation commission or um, group that will touch on this topic. And it's really, it's really, I won't say awkward, but it, it's gonna be tough because then the state, um, both uh, local county um, jurisdictions will have to kind of grapple with the roles that sometimes state agencies took um, part in as well as local law enforcement and newspapers and media outlets. Well, this is part of um, what I believe has to happen and I know you do, that we need to be having awkward, as you said, conversations. Mm -hmm. I find them not awkward as much as we need to be open to new information that's inclusive okay. instead of uh, information that we think we know and then close our minds to any new information that may make us feel uncomfortable. If we can get to the point where we can have this conversation and we can leave the word awkward out and talk about okay. its effects moving forward yeah. from the time, how did we get there? what was happening there then, and what is the result today, then we're moving towards reconciliation at some point because we're telling the whole story instead of exactly. parts of the story. Exactly. Um, one of the questions, um, does the archives, or maybe you don't want to speak for the archives, there is a, a movement about on how do you memorialize things. And I'll preface this with this time that we're talking about in lynching or after the Civil War. This was a time of um, monuments and memorials to something that became known as the lost cause. So a community that had power and privilege used monuments to emphasize their story and and glorify their uh, point of view of the history and conveniently leave out from time to time other history. And that is causing a second or third look. Besides identifying monuments that are perhaps, or not perhaps, are inappropriate in the communities or the places they are now, the times they are changing, how do we go about putting up new monuments and new memorials that tell the whole story. 
Jeff, how are we going to do that? I, you know, one, I'm going to start by saying, I don't know. I'm, I think this is something that we're in the midst of, and it's going to take a lot of conversation and dialogue on what we want to do and where we're going um, as a country. It's really a difficult moment. Um, when I think about lynchings, um, prior to Delegate Joseline Pena Melnick introducing that legislation, there had been earlier legislation where people um, from different uh, legislators who wanted to establish lynching memorials in every county in Maryland where lynching took place. And that was not successful um, because, you know, people realize that as you do this information and some people feel um, that the victims who were lynched were outright guilty. And so, you know, if you put something like that in Frederick County, you know, how would people respond to that there if they have a legacy of um, miseducation related to the lynching and how it occurred? Um, and then also reintroducing trauma for victims, families and communities who were impacted by these racial terror lynchings. Um, I think we we're gonna to have to think long and hard about how we commemorate and memorialize um, the legacy of lynching in our state is gonna be very difficult. But um, as I think about the appropriateness of, you know, lost cause memorials and things like that, I'm still trying to grapple with, you know, whether I think it's right or wrong to remove them. Um, the, when the Tawny statue was removed, um, we caught, we didn't catch any flack, but we had a lot of people, you know, trying to immediately replace him. And they thought that we had brought in the Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass statues to counter the Tawny, um, statue that was outside. And actually, that actually had been in a prior legislative session when that appropriation was made to actually install the Frederick Douglass and Harriet Tubman statue. And so a year later when Tawny was removed, it had nothing, one had nothing to do with the other. Harriet and Fred were already gonna be there whether he had been removed or not. Um, and so, you know, it was just decided that instead of trying to always replace immediately because we are still grappling with the shock of Tawny being removed, um, no matter what side you're on, um, in regards to how you feel about his statue being there. Um, you know, we just decided to kind of leave it blank. Um, I think that, you know, moving forward, we know that museums and cultural institutions are great places to grapple with difficult histories um, and tell a balanced narrative. And, you know, just knowing I've um, been an African-American woman, I could say, you know, it is it, for years, like anywhere that I've gone, when I've been on Monuments Row in Richmond, I kind of looked up like, oh my gosh, I mean, that's really in your face. And, you know, you kind of have to think about, um, you know, how these monuments and memorials make people feel. And what is the feeling that we're going for moving forward? Well, that, I, that, I have to tell you, I don't have a final answer on that, but, you know, just something that we all have to grapple with. That is the, uh, you've, you've um, identified the point that I guess I'm inelegantly making. Monuments are put up to, to bring out feelings. And I mean, that's the point of them. And it's not only to remember, but to feel the memory. And so as we go forward, what is it that we're going to remember and feel? And one of the issues that I, I run into occasionally here in Prince George's County uh, is I, I can remember as a, a member of the Historic Preservation Commission early on um, identifying uh, what we were told was a chicken coop, but we figured out it was probably slave quarters. And some of the reaction that I got outside of the commission was why would we want to have slave quarters behind our beautiful new McMansions? We, we don't want to remember this. You know, we've, we've made it. And the last thing we want to do is go out of our beautiful million dollar home 
and here is a restored slave quarters. That's not why we bought in this development. And I could see that. I mean, you, you, th there's a reason not, per, I guess, particularly to be reminded of horror. My answer was always, if you remove all the memory of the horror and evil, it is certain to reappear. Yeah, yes, I agree with um, that greatly. Um, but finding the balance between how you feel about yourself today uh, and whether that feeling should be in your backyard, I, I can see the, and run into the tension all the time. And I, and I have several other examples of, of that. I know that um, this extends to place names. Mm -hmm. uh, this county is, I believe, well, no, I don't believe, I know has a task force looking at public buildings, public spaces, and public roads uh, with the idea of identifying some that need to be renamed. And but this, this goes to the monument, monument question. It, it gets very easy to simplify the story in my mind. Uh, and, I, and I'm going to pick on a school because I know the task force can't, is, is not dealing with schools. Um, one is Duval High School. Mm -hmm. And when I heard that the, there may be a name change, I, I had no problem with a name change. I thought the students had identified uh, maybe a scientist, a mathematician. I mean, any number of black men or women, African-American men or women who had accomplished much at, at any point in history, including currently. And, and I thought that was a reasonable thing until I found, oh, we just found out that Gabriel Duvall owned slaves. And I, my reaction was, yes, um, that's correct. And I can see not wanting to be in a school named after a slave owner, but do you know anything else about him? Well, the answer was no. Right. So I would ask a few people, have you ever heard of the Queenie decision, the Queen decision? And of course they had no idea what I was talking about. And I, I would drop that. I asked them if they knew that, you know, we, we have this country in part because Gabriel Duval right after the revolution and the Articles of Confederation, when it was obvious our first government wasn't working, he was the, the talking head of the time to convince the state to adopt the constitution. Does that count for anything? The, the fact that my, uh, the other parts of these conversations knew nothing of the history was my goodness, you're simplifying the history, doing exactly what the lost cause people did. You are repeating the same idea. We're going to simplify history, find one point, and that's what we're going to memorialize or forget. And I don't know how to get around that. I mean, each side makes a good case. There's no reason to uh, not rename a high school after somebody uh, that has contributed in the immediacy to science, to art, to culture, to politics, um, to motivate students. That seems entirely reasonable at, under community standards. But, I, but the idea of throwing a little history in instead of the whole history and then having a discussion at some level kind of bothers me. And now I'm talking instead of coming up with a question for you. <laughs> it's no, no, no worries, John Peter. I, you know, we're all here to learn. I mean, you're the questioner, but I mean, I think you have something great to contribute to the conversation as well. Um, yeah, it's really difficult, but I, I've been in touch. I reached out to um, the commission um, in regards to the school renaming and I offered to give documentation for any research that they may need. And we had a discussion and um, I think they're gonna hold back a little bit on like immediate name change. And rather than that, educate their students and the community about who the individuals are. 
um, that they are actually named after because it's like, you know, you remove it, but without people knowing the history, you know, do you really have a right to remove it? So I think they're looking at ways to do this more responsibly and, you know, work with the community to decide whether, you know, they want these name changes or not. And that was the last conversation that I've had with them. Um, I don't wanna speak for them because I'm not a member of their commission. Um, I could just only tell you from a conversation that I've had. And- Well, the, I, I'm pleased to hear that they, they did reach out. My, my engagement was right at the beginning and, and hasn't, there hasn't been any, any, any further engagement or conversation with anybody. Um, and I was just using that as an example. We talked about education and you brought it up a couple times. I had the privilege a couple years ago of, um, uh, I don't wanna say teaching, lecturing on the history of Prince George's County to ninth graders. That was a most enlightening experience in, the, uh, in a long time that I've had. <laughs> um, <laughs> I am grateful to the teacher who actually sought me out and gave me the opportunity. And I was appalled um, at the lack of any knowledge of history whatsoever. I had been asked to you know, start from the beginning. And, and as I think I told you, I told the teacher, I don't think that somebody who looks like me talking to a very diverse class and starting out with some 300 years ago, old guys that looked like me cut down a bunch of trees, planted an addictive plant with slave labor, was going to keep their attention for 90 minutes. And I tried to do the history backwards in time. And I found that the students um, couldn't even get to busing. They didn't know what busing was. I, I wonder how we have this discussion if we can't somehow get history back into public education such that we have a literate uh, community when they get out of school such that they have a base to make decisions. And I don't know that you have an answer for that, but it does seem to me it starts with our education system. It does, but I think one thing um, we have to be cognizant about um, when we're talking about diverse uh, groups is that they come to the table with their own informed history. Um, when I think about Hispanic students um, coming into this country, they come with their own legacy and history that they're equipped with. Um, and so, a lot of times when we get there and we're like, you know, they don't know basic history. And even, I mean, on a level um, with different, I mean, maybe one, two generations. Um, my family's from the Caribbean, but I could tell you having um, been here, born here, you know, I'm considered African-American and I do come with um, an African-American uh, perspective and history that I have an understanding of, not just by education, but by foundation. But I also come equipped with that Caribbean knowledge as well. And so I think that um, we just have to figure out how to incorporate and bring more narratives to the table. Um, I think that, you know, there's a lot of contributions that have been made, not just recently, but years ago um, by all ethnic minorities in this country. And as we work to kind of bring balance, I think that's how we build more um, trust and openness to receiving the information. Um, you know, a lot of um, ethnic students, I mean, they're first generation here and many of their parents aren't even native English speakers. So I think we kind of put a lot of onus on people um, and we don't have like a openness to work with them um, and meet them where they're at. I think as we kind of think about history moving forward, we're going to have to rethink how we share that with people. And I don't want to go on too long with that, but, and I know we have another question in the chat, so. We ah. do, Maya and John Peter. So our first question came in from Charles. Uh, he asked, is the State House currently open to the public to view the newly placed statues? 
Unfortunately, the state house is not open to the public. I myself as a state employee even have to get, I have to get permission to actually go into the state house right now. Um, uh, as you know, um, well, I, I should stop saying as you know, I don't like to make that assumption, but um, the members of the Senate are able to actually meet within the state house, but only about half of the uh, House of Delegates are able to meet in the state house. Some of them are meeting remotely from home. So it is not open to the public, but we sure hope that once it's open to the public, everyone will go out and see the statues. Excellent. And another question, uh, will the lynching commission be making recommendations to the General Assembly on ways to promote reconciliation? Yes, we will. We have three committees. Um, we have a logistics committee that will be in charge of um, establishing public hearing meetings where people can come and give testimonies and oral histories related to information that they know about lynchings that occurred in the state. We have a research committee, which will be researching each incident. And then we also have a reconciliation committee. Um, and we, at the end of our um, life, we are responsible for submitting a report, a final report to the legislature that will include recommendations. And we are open to receive that information from, from the public. So if that person wants to um, actually make recommendations for us to consider and put forward to the legislature, we can do that. Excellent. And that is all the questions we have in the chat box. And looks like we're coming up to the top of the hour. So John Peter, thank you for uh, joining us today. And Maya, what a wonderful conversation. This has been absolutely enlightening. And I have lots of hope for this project and hope for some great things to come. So thank you for your work in this. And thank you everyone for joining us. Donna, did you want to make any closing statements before we let everyone enjoy this evening? Well, I just want to say again, thank you to Maya and John Peter for um, the discussion. Amanda, thank you for your hosting duties. Um, we are recording this and we do plan to put it up on our YouTube channel. Um, I don't know if we'll distribute it any other way, but at least it'll be up on our YouTube channel. We can provide you that information. Um, so um, thank you again for joining us this evening. And I hope you can join us for our future Monday, um, the fourth Monday of every month's chats. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.